reading from the Gospel according to Luke, the 24th chapter. Jesus himself stood among the disciples and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There are times in worship, and we feel them, when something transformational happens. And we all felt that, Jennifer. We all felt that to those who brought us the beauty of music through the bells this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much. Last Sunday, as I was listening to Reverend Samuelson's sermon, The Wounded Healer, something struck me. As she spoke about transitions and how we prepare for and embrace them here in this season of resurrection, it dawned on me that we are dealing with stages of resurrection similar to the five stages of grief that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross first chronicled in her book on death and dying in 1969. Her stages were denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. You may wonder how could stages of death relate at all to stages of resurrection and eternal life? Well, I have some thoughts on that. I'd like to share them. They're not fully formed, so bear with me. But let's explore, explore how death and resurrection are related. Please join me in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. For the last three Sundays, our resurrection texts, which have come from Mark and John and now Luke, have talked to us about some real twists and turns in Jesus' disciples' denial and bargaining and acceptance and realization of who Jesus is, the Son risen from the dead. On Easter, we found the three glorious women going to Jesus' grave to anoint his dead body and finding a young man directing them somewhere else with news that Jesus was risen. They were struck silent in the moment, but <clears throat> we know that changed. Last Sunday, John's Gospel told us the story of Thomas, who is doubting and denying the resurrection of Jesus, even as Jesus comes and stands with him and with the others. And then today, the risen Christ comes among them and appears to them like a ghost, and they're startled and terrified. So we see more stages in the coming weeks as well, where Peter and Jesus struggle to reconcile after Peter's betrayal and denial in the hours leading up to Jesus' death with their reunion at the Sea of Galilee. We will see texts of sheep and shepherds, fruit and vines, all pointing to new life. We'll encounter Jesus with a few and a few hundred 
in the texts that are still coming, all of them meeting him as the risen one. Like dealing with death and accepting death, I believe dealing with and accepting resurrection is not easy, that it's developmental. Some of us are still working on it. There are two things here that are connected. We often use the phrase death and resurrection as though they go together, or resurrection from the dead. There can be no resurrection without death, we know that. And death is simply dismal, where there is no hope of eternity and resurrection. Working through death and resurrection can be like running through a field of thistles. No one knows this better than Roy Oswald, because he has done it. In his little book, Working with Clergy on How to Healthfully End a Ministerial Relationship in the Parish, Roy tells a story from his childhood. When I was a young boy, age six, growing up in rural Saskatchewan, my two older brothers and I would often choose to walk home from school through the fields rather than along the road. It was shorter. To be sure, it was occasionally more difficult, though, because there were enormous thistle patches in the fields. I cannot remember seeing anything like it since, but those thistle patches would be 50 feet to 100 feet wide, and in other places, 10 to 20 feet. The rest of the field lying fallow in the summer was tilled soil. We rarely wore shoes to school in the summer, hence our dilemma. How do you cross a field of thistles in bare feet? We did have the choice of walking around them, but since it was the end of the day and we were hungry and tired and we knew our mom had something on the kitchen table waiting for us as a snack, we decided to take a risk. To walk around the patch would take us out of the way. And the other option was to back up and run through the narrowest part at full speed. Being the youngest, with the least speed and the smallest legs, I always objected. I was always overruled by my two brothers, who would then take, each one of them take one of my hands and run me through the thistle patch. I can vividly remember the experience, he continues, running at full speed and bare feet through 20 feet of prickly thistles, yelping in pain all the way. When the three of us would reach the black soil on the other side, we would immediately fall to the ground and start pulling the thistles out of our bare feet. There was blood in the dirt, and we would each report how many thistles got us, and I would squeal, I had four today. And how many did you have? The count of thistles was our post-agony conversation. For me, Roy continues, this story illustrates how some pastors and some people approach their endings. They rightly assume there will be pain involved, so they run through it as fast as they can and as fast as possible. He says, I deal with pastors leaving their churches all the time. It is my work. This kind of manic behavior at the close of ministry has its advantages, but there's a price to pay as well. Beyond this, it is clearly a death-denying approach to closing out one's life in one place. The advantage of running full speed through the close of a ministry or the close of a relationship or a job is giving the short shrift to the most painful part of the experience. In ministry, as in the briar patches of life with others, I have heard about endings that look just like this. The problem is the approach usually backfires. As with running through the thistles, we end up with briars in our feet on the other side, and those briars are emotional feelings that we have not dealt with. It is impossible to stuff powerful emotions deep inside, paint a smile on each of our faces, and come out the other side saying, I feel fine, and feel good about going on. But this is where dealing with the end of a ministry or a job or a relationship is different than dealing with death. Closing out a ministry is an experience we keep living through. When it is done, something else comes. 
Living, leaving can be hard work, but once it's done, there's something on the other side, both from the pastor's and the member's perspective. Oswald goes on to explain that's not the case with death. When it's over, it's over. He goes on to say that through the research he has done and discovered with congregations across the nation, that the total entities, the congregations themselves, had not had healthy endings with a minister when they tried to run through the th field of thistles with stuff sticking in them. They care, carry this unresolved stuff with them and it gets worked through in the new pastorate, or maybe not ever. Unresolved grief, including anger and denial and bargaining and depression and acceptance, get short-circuited and things left unresolved get worked out in unhealthy ways in the time that follows. Do you see how these illustrations may apply to you in your life and your work? I will tell you, after the first service, I had about five people come up to me and say, were you in my living room squeaked listening to me talk about some things I'm up against? So I think the answer can be yes. So this brings us back to the risen Christ. When he rises from the dead, Jesus spends a lot of time working through the unresolved issues related to his disciples' betrayal, desertion, denial, standing aside and hiding at the time of his death. During the time of his resurrection, he's working through the stuff that happened before this. There are unresolved issues between all of them and Jesus. You don't betray, desert, deny, crucify someone without some hard feelings being created. The risen Christ is working through the hard feelings in the 11 resurrection stories and texts. He cannot and he will not ascend to heaven without working through the unresolved stuff with his closest companions and friends on the journey. Like working through death, working through resurrection can be complicated. The last four years have been so hard for so many of us in so many places in our lives. Yesterday, I was with my granddaughter, Emran, to celebrate her fourth birthday. Because of COVID and Emran being born on April 17, 2020, does that time frame ring a bell for anyone? Susan and I could not be with Emmy on the day of her birth no one could except for her mother. When she finally came home, Susan and I drove up that night after her big brothers were asleep to look at her through the sliding glass door on their back porch. We knew we couldn't hold her. We knew they, that they couldn't really see us. The boys couldn't really see us or they would lose it. They had been told they couldn't be with their grandparents anymore for a while. So they would need to hug us and kiss us, and that wasn't gonna happen. We didn't hold Emron in our arms for the first three months of her life. Yesterday, as the five of us sat at a table on a beautiful spring day in Solon, just outside that sliding glass door, we were laughing, we were listening to the birds, we were eating and sharing stories, we were playing games together out at the table, and I thought back to that time just four years before on this very same deck on a cold April night that we ran through the thistles of COVID. It hurt. And for all of us who ran through the thistles, and we all did, and some of us still are, there are lots of scars left on our feet and on our souls. It caused us pain and reactions which we're still paying the price for. Then, as I was drifting back, my grandson, Rylan, who turned seven a few weeks ago, looked through that window as he was inside the house now taking his uh, stuff in so he could get cake. <laughs> so he looked through the window and he looked at Susan and me and blew us a kiss. Then he put his hand on the window, as any seven-year-old would do, and left a whole hand of prints on the window before his mother could see him. <laughs> and as grandparents, that was fine. 
Four years after we looked through that double-paned glass, doubling in pain and joy, there was healing and the continued joy of resurrection. As she looked at death through all her years of work and so many years ago, Dr. Kubler-Ross shined resurrection light on death. She said, when we face our fears and anxieties and try to hang in there with honesty and candor, and when we are honest about what is really going on with us, something good and life-saving comes out of these experiences. And this is where she made her most profound point. She said, the soul in torment is a person tortured from attachment to life, a torture which surges through our whole being, chilling us to the heart one minute and breaking us out in a flushing sweat the next. This is our frantic struggle to clutch at life while slipping over the brink of death. This is the self in battle with the non-self. How we leave a place a party, a relationship, a job, a church has many precursors to how we leave the world. If we take our time, if we seek out moments, days, weeks, months to say goodbye, to say thank you, if we take time to laugh and to love, to reconcile, to rejoice, and then to love again, all will go well, or mostly well. And if we own our own resurrection faith as God's Easter people, to let go of whatever we've been carrying and allow grace to now carry us through, we will be whole. In the words, in a word, I would say it this way, when we hear and play grace notes, our resurrection music will be heavenly. Grace will guide our steps. Paul Tillich describes grace this way, Grace strikes us when we are in great pain and restlessness. It strikes us when we walk through the dark valley of meaninglessness and empty life. Grace strikes us when we feel that our separation is deeper than usual because we have violated another life, a life which we loved or from which we were estranged. Grace strikes us when our disgust for our own being, our own indifference, our weakness, our hostility, our lack of direction and composure have become intolerable to us. And grace strikes us when year after year the long-for perfection of life does not appear, when our own compulsions reign within us as they have for decades, when despair destroys all joy and courage, grace comes. Sometimes at the moment, a wave of light breaks into our darkness, and it is, though, as, it is as though a voice were saying, you are accepted, you are accepted, you are accepted by that which is greater than you and the name of which you do not know. Do not ask the name now. Perhaps you will find it out later. And do not try to do anything now. Perhaps later you will do much. Do not seek for anything. Do not perform anything. Do not intend anything. Simply accept the fact that you are accepted and grace will come. So I, my friends, I invite each one of us to allow grace to strike us, to invite us to take time to move through the challenges and changes here and in your daily life with grace. I invite us to take the path of light and love and life and not run through the thistles if we can avoid it. Sometimes we can't. But if you can, do. In the words of Jesus today, don't be frightened. Don't allow doubts to arise in your hearts. Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see me. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. You see how resurrection heals, even and most significantly our wounded healer, who then invites us even closer. Thanks be to God for the risen and rising Christ. Amen. <coughs>